Hello, fellow investors. Welcome to Ritter on Real Estate, where we teach you how to passively invest like a pro. Today, my guest is Mike Morawski. Mike is a 30 plus year real estate investment veteran. He's controlled over $285 million in real estate transactions. Mike is an entrepreneur, author, real estate trainer, public speaker, and personal coach with a strong personal resilience and a deep desire to help others live an extraordinary life. He's coached hundreds of real estate investors to fulfill their dreams. And so excited to have you on today, Mike, to, uh, to gain some of those pearls of wisdom for our listeners. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Kent. I'm really glad to be here, actually. So, yeah, no, I'm excited to have you on. So, let's start at the top. You know, tell us a little bit about about you and your story, and, and what led you to to where you are now with us today. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> you know, I was in the general contracting business and did a lot of uh, uh, work and rehabs, and and one morning I woke up and I was burnt out. I just didn't want to do that business anymore. And so I looked at my wife at the time and I said, you know, I don't know what to do. And we decided to sell the company and I had a pretty good sized company in the Northwest suburbs of Chicago. So I sold that company. It took a year off. And during that year, I did uh, a couple of house hacks. And this was long before house hacking was, was a, a thing to do. Like today it's sexy, right? Back then it was not so appealing to people. And uh, over that time, I met a real estate agent who was really successful. And I thought, you know, maybe this is a business to go into. So I decided to go to him and I said, hey, Todd, uh, can you teach me what to do to be successful in the real estate business? And he goes, you know what? Let me make you a cassette tape. And I say that because that's how long ago this was, mm -hmm. right? I don't think you can find something today to make a cassette tape on. So he made me a tape. I listened to that thing over and over and over again, went, got licensed. And my first eight months in the real estate business, I sold 78 houses, built a team selling 125 a year. And from there, uh, I did that for like the next eight to nine years. 2005, I saw the market starting to shift and, and get soft. And as the market started to shift, I thought, geez, I really am going to need to do something different because I'm not sure what, what's going to happen. So I had always wanted to be in the apartment business. I had watched some of the large syndicators that were in the Chicago market over the years, and I understood the model. You know, you raise private equity, you marry it with a great real estate deal, Kent provided everything goes well, everybody makes money, and things are great. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, I syndicated my first deal in 2005, and I was so excited. I raised I put a little ad in the paper that said real estate investors wanted, and my phone rang off the hook. I was able to raise about $200,000 on a $600,000 deal, and I was off to the races. Over the next 30 months, I bought, 30, uh, bought $60 million worth of real estate. I raised $18 million in private equity, and it was about 4,000 apartments in five different states. Along the way, I built a property management company where we were managing 7,500 doors. Uh, today, that brings me to the coaching and training space. Uh, that's where I'm at today. So, oh, very exciting, very exciting. So, um, so, so, 2005, you you did your first syndication, and yeah. you started building out uh, your property management company. You scaled up from there, and then, um, you know, I mean, take take us through the rest of kind of, you know, from from there. I mean, continue through today. Tell us where. Yeah. So uh, 2005, I did my first deal. It was an 11 unit deal and it went well. Uh, you know, the deal had some hair on it and I didn't, you know, I didn't know enough about the business when I first went into it, but I think that's how we learn along the way is we make some mistakes and we get back up, right? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, from, from that first deal, my next one was 64 units, then 87, and then I was in the 180 range and 250 and you know, before I knew it, I was closing 400 unit deals and I was in five different states around the country. And how I did that was I, I did my first deal in Chicago and realized we weren't going to make any money in that market, that we needed to go somewhere else. And so I chose markets that the price point was better. I had a different all in cost 
and I was able to get a better return for my investors. And things went well uh, for, for a period of time. 2008, um, I'm sitting in a restaurant having uh, lunch with my CFO and we're watching the news happen to be on and they were carrying boxes out of Lehman Brothers by the dozens. Mm-hmm. And I looked at my CFO and I said, hey, we're screwed, aren't we? And he goes, yeah, we're in big trouble. And, you know, and it wasn't just us, it was the whole world, right? We went into the worst economic crisis in the world. Mm -hmm. I made some, some bad choices along the way, business wise in growth. You know, I closed an awful lot of real estate, 2007, I bought 17 deals. It was 2,700 units. We grew way too fast, very unstable. And, um, it was like, it was like balancing a chair on two legs and trying Mm -hmm. to sit there comfortably. And so 2008 happened and we thought, well, maybe we can ride this out because we're in the commercial side. All these people are going to lose their houses on the residential side due to foreclosures. The occupancy should be okay in the apartments. We should be able to keep uh, our occupancy up, pay our bills, we'll be all right. Thought we could mitigate it through, but that wasn't really what happened. 2010 rolled around and you know, the end of 2009, people started moving out of apartments in the in droves. So our occupancies went from, we were buying deals, Kent, that were um, 75, 78% occupied, re-engineering them, doing mm-hmm. rehabs, refixing them up, putting them back on the market, re-tenanting them, driving occupancies into the low 90s. And um, then we hit a wall the end of 2009 I had a deal, and I'll just tell this quick story, but I, I had a deal in, in Anderson, Indiana, where when we bought this, it was the best, it was the number one city in the country to raise a family in. It was a 200 unit deal. And I get a phone call on a Monday morning from my property manager and she's in tears. She says, I have 32 moving trucks in the parking lot. I don't have a scheduled move out for 45 days. So this is the kind of stuff that happened across the board. Our wow. occupancies dropped from, you know, the low 90s to the, um, you know, high 70s, um, mid 70s. And when you take that kind of a hit and your occupancy drops, your NOI gets out of balance, your values drop, you know, nobody ever saw a 40% decrease in value coming. Uh, nobody ever saw 30% decreases in occupancy coming. And we got hit really hard. So I, I'm the kind of guy I like to make everybody happy. I'm the hero. I think I can make everything work well. And uh, so what I tried to do was I tried to keep all my investors safe. I had a few deals that got really bad and that should have just went to foreclosure and should have let you know 30 or 40 investors get hurt. But I tried to save everybody. So I tried mm-hmm. to right the ship and move money between companies. So I had profitable companies that were doing really well. And I take the profits from there and I would move them to prof, uh, co- to companies and properties that weren't operating well, thinking that the market wasn't going to, was going to come back. Mm-hmm. You know, I've seen corrections in the market before, right? Maybe 10%, 12%, but nobody saw a 40% correction coming. I saw corrections that took 17, 18 months in a recession for that market to come back. Nobody saw it taking eight years to come back, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I got caught in in this place where I was moving money back and forth, trying to keep the ship afloat. And and that wasn't so much the problem. The problem was that I didn't disclose it to my investors. And because of non-disclosure, I wound up being charged on wire fraud and mail fraud charges and got sentenced to a 10-year prison sentence uh, in federal prison. Yeah. Wow. And so, so that's uh, obviously kind of worst case scenario, right? I mean, I just think that there's, you know, understand kind of the, um, you know, the intention, uh, you know, of what you're, what you were trying to do and kind of, you know, and, and how that, how it ended up playing out. And so, so you end up at, I imagine it is probably the low point in, in your maybe life, but definitely career and, So from there, you know, how do you, how do you pick yourself back up? How do you, how do you get back to, you know, 
get, get back to uh, tell us you know, how do you get back to where you are today? So, you know, I said earlier on, I said, it's how we stumble. Right. And it's, we can fall and we're going to fall at some point. We're going to stub our toe, but it's a matter of how we get back up from it. And you're right. It was a low point in my business. And I really thought it was the lowest point I could go. I went to prison and, you know, I, I went from this, this level of success where I lived, you know, modest upper middle class um, lifestyle. Hey, I never bought uh, boats. I didn't buy fancy cars. I didn't buy a big house. I didn't fly private. I didn't do any of that stuff. I tried to save my business, but I went from at one point and we made millions of dollars in that 30 months during that time while the market was going crazy. Our equity balance came up. We had cash in the bank. We, it was, it was an interesting time to all of a sudden turn around and lose it in like nine seconds. Mm -hmm. um, so I go to prison and I go from living this relatively pretty decent lifestyle to um, now all of a sudden I'm living in a room with three other men in a two by five locker with three green outfits and, and five pairs of underpants thinking that my life's over. And then my mm -hmm. wife decided she was gonna leave me and when that happened, that ruined me. So that was like the yeah. worst day of my life, the worst yeah. experience of my life. So I was in prison for about three months, a little under three months. And I walk in the gym one day and, and you have to remember, I'm probably 35 pounds overweight at that point and not feeling good about myself, just hating life, wondering what's happened to me, how I've gotten here and trying to mitigate through prison camp with a lot of people that you wonder you know, how are you going to do this on a daily basis? I'm sure. And so um, this kid walked up to me one day and I say kid, cause he was younger than me. And um, he said, look, don't let these people beat you. All they want to do is beat you. They want to take every ounce of blood that they can suck out of you, out of you. And he goes, what they can't take is what made you successful. What they can't take is your desire, your commitment and your knowledge. He said, come in this gym, come to my class every day, work out with me. Let me help get you back in shape physically. And that was the best advice anybody ever gave me. You know, there's a, there's a saying in prison that says we can either do the time or let the time do us. And I chose to do the time. So I started going to the gym every day. I started losing weight. I started to feel better physically. As I felt better physically, I felt better emotionally. I decided to go to college. Um, I'd never been to college, Kent. So I uh, had to get two things. I had to find a scholarship and a correspondence program. Went to college uh, and got a bachelor's degree in theology over a four year period. I wrote two books while I was gone. One is uh, Exit Plan, Your Complete Guide to Multifamily Investing and, and Why You Need an Exit Plan Before You Buy. We mm -hmm. can talk about that more. Yeah. Another one on property management. I taught uh, real estate investing and I taught property management in prison for five years. I wrote an ethics program and taught ethics. How ironic, right? <laughs> um, I taught Bible study for five years. But Kent, I was on an outreach program and I go into the community and I told my story about 40 times to the small and local business owners and to um, the college students in the area. I uh, met a friend, uh, uh, befriended a professor from the University of Minnesota. And we just got published in the Business Journal of Ethics, a publication, uh, 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 ethics case study that we worked on for about two years and just had it published. And it gets taught at the college level for forensic accounting classes and um, sales and marketing and, and accounting classes at, in prison. So or not in prison, but in college. Um, so I've done a lot. And today, like I said, I'm in the coaching and training space. So I came back with the intention of delivering a message to people that um, could help them because it's really easy to get in trouble. And it's really easy to make a mistake that will change the direction of your life. And I really feel today that there's a lot of women and men who run companies, own companies, who who are in middle management positions, who are running teams that are, are faced with pressure every day. 
that are faced with hard decisions that they need to make every day. And one wrong move and we can wind up in a bad spot. And so, um, you know, I hope that I can deliver a message that people are gonna grasp, hold on to, and really be able to grow from and learn from. Yeah, Mike, I think I, one, just thanks for sharing your story. I think that's, uh, it's inspiring to hear, you know, the resiliency and, you know, how you got through that and how you, how you turn that, you know, what, what is a terrible situation into something so positive and, and now you've come out of it and um, you're, you're, you've taught an ethics class or written an ethics course and now it's being taught. And, and, and that is, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, that's great. That's great. So congratulations and um, just happy to hear where you are and, and how you've come through that now. And so as we, as we kind of get back to, to the focus on investing, you know, what, I know, I know multifamily real estate is still one of your passions today. I know you spend a lot of time, like you said, coaching and teaching people about the subject. So, so why is multifamily, uh, you know, your, your investment, your asset class of choice? Yeah. So, you know, people ask that question a lot and they ask that question in a couple of different ways. You know, why do you like real estate so much? And Mm -hmm. I'm passionate about it because there's so much to learn. You know, if you look at the multifamily space, there's a number of buckets you could play in, right? Student housing, medical, assisted living, or market rate rent. That's where I spent my time was in the market rate rent arena. But there's so much to learn. And I think it's a very fluid business. Things change, you know, uh, cap rates go down, price goes up, you know, cap rates go up, price comes down, markets change, the bonds change, uh, interest rates change. So, so it's a very fluid place to be and you all, it keeps you on your toes. Mm-hmm. And I think it's, it's important as an investor, whether you're an active or a pr- passive investor, that you are aware of what's going on and those mm-hmm. changes. Um, you know, I said that I was in the construction business. When I was in the construction business, I did a lot of work for Inland Real Estate. Inland you know, four high school teachers started that company, right? They bought mm-hmm. one four unit apartment building. They raised the money to do it. Today, 40 years later, they're the largest REIT in the world. They're in every asset class in 80 countries around the world. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I say that because you never know where you can go with this business, but, but I did a lot of work for them. I did a lot of work on their swimming pools and in their apartments when I was in the construction business. And I learned the model. I got it. I understood the private equity piece. I understood how the overall global picture of it worked. And as I got into the intricacies of the, of the early evaluations and the due diligence and looking at things like how household income interacts with uh, rent increases, you know, you start looking at those things and, and you don't have to be an economist or a mathematician to get it, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So it's an interesting space to be in. Yeah, absolutely. And just, you know, I'm interested in, in through your experience having, you know, there, there's not a lot of people, I won't say it. There's, there are a lot of people in the space that, that have not been through, um, you know, a crisis like, like 2008 that weren't, weren't investing in that period. And so I think there's, it's great talking with folks that have been through a crisis like that and, and getting some of those lessons learned. You know, what are some things, if you were out acquiring properties now, and what are some things that you would, you would do differently as you're, as you're looking at properties, um, as you're, as you're under, underwriting or looking to acquire, and what are things that are there things that stick out in those deals that did not perform versus those deals that performed that, that you can share um, for things for people to look out for? Yeah. You know, that's a, that's a really great question. And there's a number of things. I, I wrote a list probably of 30 uh, mistakes that I did wrong that I will do differently as I go back into that space. Mm-hmm. Part of my redemption is to, you know, go back and do, do some apartment deals. Um, but one, one thing was I was over leveraged. I bought property and 
back then they were throwing money at you, Kent. I mean, yeah. throwing money at you, whether it was a private investor or whether it was a bank. I was in million dollar, multi-million dollar deals at 10% down. It's, it was a joke. I was yeah. way over leveraged. My average, uh, uh, I was 85% loan to value across the board. I would never suggest to anybody to be that. I mm -hmm. would think that today you need to be 65 to 70% in case something happens. I overpaid for properties. You know what? Don't marry a deal. Don't get emotionally involved because when mm -hmm. you get emotionally involved, you, you overpay. Yep. And overpaying just causes challenges, right? Yep. Um, I didn't pay attention to the, to the KPIs, those key performance indicators, right? I, I, I just... I looked the other way. I saw red flags. People told me about red flags around me and I didn't pay attention. Mm -hmm. um, I kept, my thought was, hey, I'll, I'll keep building the company. We'll raise some more money. We'll do another deal. We do another deal. We bring cash in. As long as I keep cash flow coming in, we'll be able to, you know, it doesn't work that way. I grew mm -hmm. way too big. I had 138 employees. I didn't need that many employees. Um, I had loans that were uh, went sideways after Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns went out of business. Yeah. And you're right. There's a lot of people that didn't go through that time. But but I have some peer, you know, I, I went through that time with with some some guys who have come out of it and they've done really well. And I've gone through it with some guys that got crushed mm -hmm. and they are not in this business anymore. So mm -hmm. I'm grateful that I'm in the business, back in the business. And um, uh, I know that uh, as a result of that, you know, the, as a result of the mistakes I made, I will uh, do things differently moving forward. You know, here, mm -hmm. and let me just give you this as a, as a, as a good example too. Um, I underraised. I didn't raise enough money. And then one of the things I had in my documents was that I um, would not go back to my investors for a cash call. So if I needed money, mm -hmm. I had written in my PPM that I couldn't ask my investors for capital. So I had my hands tied, right? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I'm supposed to be this hero and I had things set up thinking that the market was gonna be great and the market changed. So uh, one thing I would do different today is I would over raise money so that I had money on the spread like, you know, when you evaluate a deal right now, you're looking at, at that vacancy rate, call mm -hmm. it 10%. But what do you do when the vacancy rate drops below that? And right. how do you sustain yourself for a period of time? Today, I'd overraise money and I'd put money in an escrow account, and let it sit there at low interest and um, uh, just for a safety valve mm -hmm. in case something happened. And I think there's different things to look at today. Yeah, I think that's extremely good advice. And and I appreciate everything that you shared. I mean, yeah, some of the things that that you shared that stick out to me are, you know, well, I mean, just going into the deal, right? Like the the quote is you, you make your money when you buy, right? Yeah. So so buying right, buying at the right price, not getting emotional, I think is a a huge risk for, for many investors, right? Because you spend so much time on these deals even before you own it. Right. And it's very easy to get emotionally involved and, and to want to tweak those numbers and make that spreadsheet look like, you know, make that deal work on that spreadsheet. Um, and, th and that's a dangerous game to play. Right. So I appreciate that advice. I think the, the idea about, you know, not being over leveraged and being smart with your debt and making sure that you've got, um, you know, you've got a low, to a low enough loan to value that you, where your debt payments aren't so high that if, if you do see that drop in occupancy, that, that you can, you can ride out that storm. Right. And I think that goes to the other thing of, of putting extra cash in, into the deals. I mean, that's something that we started doing through COVID was, was putting about double the cash uh, from a reserve standpoint into the deals that, that we previously had just to have that extra cushion um, because you never knew what was going to go wrong. And, and, and luckily knock on wood, you know, um, to this point, it, it's been minimal impact, but just having that safety net, I think extremely important. So I appreciate you sharing those. Yeah. yeah. I like what you said about, you know, you make money when you go into a deal and it's true in real estate. That's where we make our money, right. Is when we buy the deal. 
but mm -hmm. we don't realize it till we get out of the deal. And that's part <laughs> yeah. Of, that's, yeah. So, so that's part of my exit plan strategy. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, no, very and, good. No, no, I love that. I love that transition into the exit plan because I do want to talk about that. And, and yeah, you don't, <laughs> yeah, you, you don't know until you go and you try to sell it and say, oh, wow, I can't get that value that I thought I was going to. And because I paid too much right. on the front end, um, I have to be there. Right. Um, so, yeah, I think that you're right. You don't realize it till it's yeah. time to sell. Yeah. So, so this exit plan, I, I think this is a really interesting topic, right? We spend so much time talking about how do you become an investor? How do you get into deals, right? How do you do your first syndication, right? There's so much content about that. There's not a lot of content to your point. I think probably why you wrote the book of how do you get out and how do you get out successfully? So yeah. love, love for you to just expand on that a little bit. Yeah. Um, so I've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars over the years in coaching and training and books and tapes, really great trainers, really good instructors out there. And I still have two coaches today, right? I believe coaching is really important in our lives and um, it, it helps keep you balanced and it helps keeps you accountable. Two major things. Mm -hmm. But uh, over the years, I always left these seminars kind of feeling empty, like I was missing something, right? And one day it occurred to me, I read uh, Stephen Covey's book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Yeah. And chapter two in that book is start with the end in mind. And it was almost like a realization that I went, oh my goodness, you know, start with the end in mind. Why am I not planning these deals? Why am I not planning my real estate structure to um, get out? Because that's where I make my money. So today when I look at a deal and I evaluate a deal and, and I run a 10 year spread, there's a sweet spot somewhere along the way where it's most profitable. Yeah. Why do you not do something at that sweet spot? Mm -hmm. You could sell the deal and, and relinquish all control, or you can pull cash out. You can bring an investor in, refinance it, restructure the deal. There's a number of different ways to exit, and it's not just one, one solid way. Yeah. And I believe that you have to look at your deal going into it before you ever get to the closing table, knowing how you're getting out and when you're getting out. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's fantastic advice. I think that, yeah, the exit strategy is so important. Right. And, and yeah. no, knowing, I mean, I always try to look at it as we want to have multiple exit strategies. So what are, what are the three ways that, that we could, we could exit this deal successfully, right? Like who, who are we going to sell to, right? Who are the seller profiles? Who are we trying to sell to, you know, are there different groups that we can sell to, or do we have to sell to one particular type of investor, you know, is refinancing an option? I, mean, I think all those things, yeah. um, it, it's a great, I, I think a great topic, uh, you know, and something really important to look at as, as you're looking at these deals. Yeah, for sure. That's awesome. So, so continue on, on with, with the exit plan. So, you know, you know, tell us more, what is, you know, what is the process that we go through to, to develop this plan? And is it, is it deal specific yeah. or is it, is it more global than that? Well, I, you know what? I look at each deal specific, but you talked, okay. to, you know, you said something pretty interesting. You said have three plans, right? So one of the plans I had in my business, um, was that we were going to package everything and we would have we would have sold the entire company to a hedge fund mm. at a certain point in time. Yeah. That was part of our our plan back then. And you know, of course, the reason the market crash, what you know, when the market crashed, none of that was happening. Sure. Matter of fact, the first institutional deal I ever closed was with an insurance company, and it was the Friday uh, before Christmas in two thousand and eight. Mm -hmm. And Kent, it was like a window closed. And that was the last institutional equity deal that got done for two years. And I had people, people, I had no idea who they were from large, large syndicators calling going, how did you get that deal done with them? And, you know, I was like, man, I just accorded him. He saw what we were doing. And so uh, that particular deal was, was one of my exit plans. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I was in a deal with some private equity investors and the insurance company decided that they wanted to be part of that particular deal. Mm -hmm. So we exited uh, the uh, private investors, put them in another deal yep. and the insurance company came in and we took a large amount of profit off the table when we did that. 
uh, which was interesting because it happened like before the world went, you know, to hell in a handbasket. Right. right. So, um, so yeah, I, I think right. that. So yeah. Well, I was going to say that's another strategy, right? You can recapitalize a, a current deal, right? You can pay off your current investors. You can bring in new investors if you think there's still legs to run, you know, and take it another round. Just another way to approach it. And, and there always is, you know, that's what I talked about. There's that sweet spot. So somewhere between mm -hmm. five and eight years is, a, is your most profitable point. At that sweet spot, why don't you pull capital off the table, pull capital out of the deal and run for another round, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. Then, so there are different strategies. And so oh, interesting. So so between five and eight years is the sweet spot. Why is that? I don't know. I don't know. But if you look at, at most deals that you do, and I don't want to say everyone, but I think it's pretty close to everyone, and you run a 10-year spread, you're going to see a profitability point somewhere between five and a half to eight years mm -hmm. where it's the highest peak. And then it starts to, to level back off. It mm -hmm. like comes over the top. Right. Yeah. And, and when that happens uh, or when that just before that, you know, you, you talk about being able to time to market. Well, if you look at it right there, that's where it's happening for you because mm -hmm. you got your cap X done. you got new tenants in. You know, you've re-engineered the the uh, the property. You've re-engineered yep. the portfolio, and now all of a sudden you're going to level off, yep. right? Because you yep. can't do anything else. Right. So once once all that heavy lifting is done, you you can go on and and do something different, right? Restructure it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And the. I think on my opinion of you get to that eight to 10 year mark, well, you're going to get to a point where you're going to have to, you're going to have to re-renovate, right? You're going to, you're going to have to go through another cycle of CapEx. And if you haven't raised, if you, if you don't have the money set aside to do that, which most people don't, like, why would you have a deal where you're going to go through two cycles? Yeah. Um, you're going to start having to pull from operations to do those things, to keep those units updated, right? Like if you think about timing of, you know, vinyl flooring, not even just style, but think about like LVT flooring lifespan of five to seven years and things like that. You're going to start to, to run into those things, plus just style changes, right? So, so I can see the you know, I kind of understand that sweet spot. I mean, it makes sense to me, but I definitely wanted to get your perspective too. And, and I think, like you said, on the front end, it's kind of how quickly can you get the work done and you get the work done and you, and you realize the value of those renovations. And then you're right, you level off to a point where you're just going to get organic rent growth, right? And, and organic rent growth, I mean, that could, it could be good or, or it could be, you know, one, one to 2%. And, um, you know, over time, that's going to erode your, your total returns because just not as much as you're able to get on that initial bump through the renovations, right? So right, yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. So it's like five to eight years. Then I think as, as you even, then if you think about it from a tax standpoint, you think about the high end of that. When you get to a point where you're, you've started to burn off all of your depreciation and you start to lose um, some of the value there too, that's probably a little farther out, like maybe you're 15 or so. But, right. but there definitely is, I think, a, a max shelf life for real estate deals if you're trying to really maximize the, the returns and not just hold, you know, for the super long term for cash flow. Yeah, yeah for sure. For sure. Um, yeah. Well that that's that's really interesting. I, I love the perspective on exit plan. And uh, I think that's a big value. I think people should check out that book. Yeah. And actually if uh, your listeners want to go and download a free copy, they can go to my website and do that. They just put in mycoreintentions.com forward slash exit plan and they can download a free ebook if you're like me and you want to read a book and highlight it and write in the margins and dog ear the corners um you know you can buy one there too but uh you can your listeners can definitely go and download that ebook for free so awesome awesome well thanks for sharing that resource mike and so as we um you know, you shared a ton of advice, um, a lot of good lessons learned. Appreciate your just your vulnerability and sharing your story with us too, because I think that you know you could you could see the the well intentioned you know the, the the well intentions behind why you did what you did, but still um, you know not understanding the 
you know, the full, imp- the full impact of that. Right. And, and ultimately yeah. the consequences of that. But then, so I think there's great lessons learned there and, and then coming out of it and, and your story of, uh, you know, I don't know if redemption's the right word, but, but at least being able to, to come back from that and come back better and, and find uh, find a new path. And now you're coaching and you're, and you're teaching people and allowing people to, to learn from your lessons so they don't repeat the same mistakes. So I just applaud you for that. I think that's, that's amazing. Yeah. Thanks Kent. I appreciate that. And, and you know, I, I think it is redemption. You know, I think that when you bounce back from something that's that devastating, mm-hmm. um, you, you're rebuilding trust in a lot of people and you, you know, um, you, you know, one thing about trust, right, is you, you get rid of trust, you, you empty a bucket just like that by turning it over, but you fill it mm-hmm. back up by a teaspoon at a time. And, yep. you know, so it, it becomes, uh, you know, it, that's where that redemption piece comes in. How do you restore yourself to the community, to the stakeholders, the people around you, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, as we wrap up the show, I, I want to get into our keys to success segment. And I've got a couple of questions I'd love to ask you, Mike. The first one is, you know, what is the one question that every investor should be asking their deal sponsor? Where's this market going to go right now? Yeah. I, I think that uh, that's a question that we need to be um, aware of today. We're in a climate where cap rates mm-hmm. are really compressed. It's a seller's market and that uh, things will change. And what's going to happen when they change? What are the, what are the stop gaps that a sponsor has in place? You know, I talked about the one, right, where, Hey, do I have enough money sitting on the side in case the bottom falls out? And can I withstand a storm for a period of time? So, and, and you kind of addressed that when you said you put more money in reserves, right? So, yeah. I, so those are great things. I think when somebody looks at you as a sponsor and they see that you've taken that initiative or done something like that, that, that goes, you know, way beyond putting a feather in your cap, you know? Um, yeah. So. No, I appreciate that. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, you're just trying to, trying to be as conservative as possible. Right. And, and do what's right by do what's right with the numbers, not falling in love with the deal, not, not, um, making exceptions, right. To, to make that deal work, I think is what's critical and just being very objective. So what are you most proud of in your career? Um, Honestly, it's that I didn't allow this situation in my life to keep me down, that I have bounced back. Uh, You know, this will probably date this tape a little bit, but this podcast a little bit, but um, I've been home for about a year. And in a year, I have really bounced back. And um, I, I could have you, you know, I go back to that saying, right, that you can either do the time or let the time do you. And I could have mm-hmm. chose to um, let my life be over, but I chose not to. And so I, I'm proud about the fact that I've been able to come back, build a company that I can help other people, that I can work with other people and coach other people, mm-hmm. um, keep people accountable, help people make smart choices and live a balanced lifestyle. Yeah, no, that, that's great. Obviously something to be very proud of. So thanks for sharing. What's one book that everyone should read and it, it could be yours. Yeah, well, they should definitely read mine for sure. <laughs> and, and they should probably read the Bible too. But um, mm-hmm. I, uh, I, I have to say, and I, I've said this over and over again, I think one of the greatest investment books I've ever read is Gary Keller's book, The Millionaire Real Estate Investor. Mm-hmm. And it's very practical. It's it's a guided tour of investing in real estate. Uh, he wrote that book. Um, it's got to be 20 years old now. I used to teach that and give it away uh, to real estate investors when I was selling real estate. Um, and I think it's a classic. I still refer to parts of it and sections of it today in my own investing career. So 
um, I believe that it's a classic. So great. Yeah, that's a that's a fantastic book. And lastly, what is your number one key to success? Oh, uh, tenacity. I had mm -hmm. uh, I was probably in the real estate business three years, and this guy said to me, "He goes, Morowski, you're so tenacious." It was a client, and I was very gracious about it. I said, "Hey, thanks." Thinking I, I had no idea what he meant by that. I ran yeah. home, grabbed the dictionary, and looked up the word, <laughs> and. And figured out, wow, that is me, right? I'm very tenacious. I'm the guy that keeps going and going and going. I don't mm -hmm. let you telling me no or telling me that I can't succeed keep me from going forward. Yep. Um, and I think it's tenacity for me. Yeah, awesome. And Mike, how can folks get a hold of you if they want to learn more about, about what you're doing, your, your programs, the events you're putting on? Where can folks reach you? Yeah, so I love to network with people and I'm very open to it. So email me directly at mike at mycoreintentions.com or you can follow me on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook and my YouTube channel is My Core Intentions. So I'm pretty loud on social media. Feel free to connect with me. And if you have questions, we could schedule a time and, and I'm more than happy to spend some time with anybody. Awesome, Mike. Well, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks again for, for telling your story and, and, you know, imparting some of your pearls of wisdom and yeah, uh, you wish you the best uh, with the next stage. Thanks, Kent. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely.